So we considered Moses. We considered Moses only briefly when we were looking at the book of Exodus. <clears throat> but we haven't considered Moses enough. And, and we should. So let's think about Moses. Moses was a Hebrew raised as an Egyptian in the Pharaoh's house to be the Pharaoh's successor. So he was raised in the Egyptian military tradition, right? And as a young man, he solved the problem of the two men fighting by murdering one of them. Right? And now uh, we've seen him as a war leader a number of times and uh, when the Amalekites came he ordered them killed and Moses was uh, more warlike than most of us, right? So what was Moses' strength? Well, Moses' strength was to undo the Egyptian culture and he knew the Egyptian culture because he'd been raised in it. What was another strength that we ran on last week? That he was meek, meaning what? First. Yes, he wasn't the boss because he wanted to be, he was the boss, why? Because God told him he had to be, he really didn't want it, and if somebody else had been made the boss, what would he have said? Right. <laughs> yeah. But he would need to do help. <laughs> yes, so his strength was that he was meek. He was, uh, that's right, he would have been perfectly willing to assist somebody else. Did you notice that he had two sons, and the two sons became priests, of course, and he married into the Midianite uh, priestly family. So he really, I think he could do that because he was a Hebrew, raised as Egyptian, he was already cross-cultural, right? Then he moves away from that because Egypt represented something bad to him, it was a failure in his life. So he went over here, he married the priestess of Midian, the Midianite, then, then of course he was instrumental in creating another culture, the Yahweh's culture that was something new, something different. It was, it was a little bit Egyptian, it was a little bit Midianite, it was some of Yahweh's new directions, and it was some of the old patriarchal religion, right? The old Canaanite patriarchal religion of Abraham, all mixed together and making something new. And Moses was a synthesizer and he was able to do that. Obviously he could stand change and he was adept at change. But despite this fact of having these sons who were priests, priests through both his appointment and the Midianite priestly family, Moses had a weakness. And the weakness of course showed in the murdering of the uh, man in the first place. What was his weakness? Impulsiveness. I don't think he was impulsive. I think he thought things through. Uh, look at the way he planned. He told the spies, find out where the fortified cities are, see if the people are living in villages or cities where the roads are, where the, uh, where the crops are, right? These are the things you would want to know if you were planning what? A military campaign, yes. Because, of course, that was his background. Just think about it. Who were his assistants? Well, he had Aaron speaking for him, but who really was his assistant? We've seen this several times now. What? Joshua, this Hosea that he named Joshua, Yahweh's salvation. And what was this Joshua's background? Being a, uh, what was he? He was a military officer. Here's a, a Hebrew who had been in the Egyptian army and was a military officer in the Egyptian army. Now, isn't that interesting? Who did Moses identify with? Because like seeks like. Like seeks like. Um, who did Moses identify with? He wasn't bringing along his sons as successors. Who was he bringing along? Another Hebrew trained in the Egyptian military tradition. That was Moses' minister. That's who was guarding Moses' tent. That's who was clearly Moses' successor and right-hand man. And that tells us something. 
What was Moses' weakness? His weakness wasn't his impulsiveness, it was his what? What? Moses had one major character weakness, and we've already seen it a number of times. What was it? Yes, anger. Now, we have to read God's statements in the light of the fact that he was not only bringing along Israel as a whole, he was bringing <coughs> along Moses too. Okay? So that, this is human nature and psychology, when Israel got out of hand, what was Moses' reaction? He get furious. What did he want to do? He'd want to kill him. But then God would say something like this. This is human nature. Moses was ready to kill him, see? Because that was his nature. And then God say with something like this. Get out of the way so that I can kill them all. And then what would Moses do? <laughs> He's going to get in the way. <laughs> say what? No, but you can't. Well, why did God say that every time? For that, no. What? For that, no, you can't. Yes, so that he could place Moses in God's position of saying, no, that's not the way to handle it. Because it was a role reversal thing. It's done all the time in psychology. It was projection. Moses was angry, wanted to kill him. God would say, get out of the way so I can kill him. And Moses would say, no, but you can't do that. Because you're God. And he starts mouthing the, the role that God must take. God was trying to bring him along. And he almost made it, but he didn't. Okay. So it wasn't God who was done. Uh, sometimes people say there's contradiction in the Bible. So if they read that, they would, they would see that God was seeing uh, If you read the text straightforward, and the rabbis understood this and interpreted it correctly. This is not a new interpretation I'm giving you. It's centuries old. The rabbis were right. They understood... It was God testing Moses, putting Moses in the middle and saying, I'm going to kill him so that Moses could say, no, you can't, to put Moses in God's role of being the protector of the people, not the killer of the people. If you read the, in other words, I'm saying, if you read the line straight, as a straight line that God really intended to kill him, then you're missing the point, and you're not reading the text with any subtlety. Okay. then you think that God means everything he says well he means everything he says when he says this I mean this <laughs> other times he might just be testing to see what you think and this was the case mm. yes Moses got very frustrated and we see the anger a lot the, the, the source of the anger wasn't going to go away unfortunately so what was the solution <laughs> If the source of the anger wasn't going to go away, what was going to have to go away if Moses was going to have a happy life? The anger was going to have to go away. Yes. Okay. Each one of these disasters in the wilderness is killing off more of the first generation <coughs> so as to prepare the second generation. Now just think. The people who went into Canaan were people who either remembered the crossing of the Reed Sea as children or were too small to remember it or weren't born and didn't remember it at all for whom it was merely a story from their parents who had grown up in the wilderness and that's the point. They grew up as a wilderness people not see the the Hebrew slaves were slaves, but they were slaves in Egypt, the richest place in the world, in the Nile Delta, which is a tropical area, right? But this second generation was growing up how? They were growing up in the wilderness to become what? Desert people with the natural acceptance of hardship as a way of life. Moses had already been in the wilderness 40 years. And now the second generation was coming along to that point where uh, this is why Moses wasn't so frustrated with the hardships. He'd been living in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. It was a normal way of life. He just had all these people with him now who were complaining. <laughs> 
That's doubtless why he clung to his wife's family. Why? Because they were desert people like him. They weren't complaining about the desert. It wasn't a problem for them to be where there was very little water and very little food. That's the way they lived. He really hated to see his brother-in-law go. I suppose that some of that severity that he had was part of his military background. It's part of the same severity that Joshua had. Where did it come from? It was probably that same background that made Caleb and Joshua not concerned about invading Canaan. What was their reaction? It's ripe for the picking. Absolutely easily done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're taller, but they're, but they're not, not prepared for us. They knew the military tactics, and it's interesting how God was going to do this, because God could have emptied the land by killing all the people with the plagues, so there wasn't any people in it the next day. It's not how he intended for them to win it. He intended them for to win it with their own armed struggle. Mm, it would be nicer if God didn't make us struggle and do all the work, <laughs> since he could uh, take care of it himself. He could answer all the problems overnight, but doesn't choose to. Has this persistent plan to use people to carry out the plan of salvation. Um, it had to have been a di bitter disappointment for Moses, as well as Caleb and Joshua, not to go in. These twelve men whose names appear only at the story of the twelve spies, these names appear nowhere else but in Numbers 13. These were the militia leaders, the, the leaders of the tribal levies, the war leaders of Israel. It's ironic then, these were the war leaders. How were the people going to feel if their war leaders said what? Mm -hmm. You can't do it, we'll be mown down. Well, if that's what your war leaders say then. Isn't it true that you can't win a war that you're convinced you can't win? Isn't that true? <clears throat> the United States came to that conviction not long ago. We were fighting a war. We could have won in about 30 days, but what? We came to the absolute belief that what? Couldn't be done and therefore what? That's right. Even the most powerful nation in the world, if it believes it can't win, what? You might as well give up, because you can't win. Well, so that's what happened here. For a war leader like Moses, trained in the military uh, tradition of Egypt, how do you think it felt to have the place right for the picking and then have to go back? Do you think he blamed the people? Do you think he blamed the, the 12 spies or 10 of them? Uh, how do you think it did on Moses' natural tendency toward being an angry person? They give him a, 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 a door of temptation? Yeah, I think so. Especially since, since the, the decision was so personal. Every time they were angry with their situation, who was the lightning rod? Who were they angry with? They never said, yeah, they never said it's our fault. Well, they never said we should be calmer about these things. They said, why did you bring us here? And after all, what would have to be Moses' true answer? I didn't want to bring you here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Moses, like most people, had some opposites in him. He was gracious to the point of saving the people again and again when God placed him on the spot. But he was still having a problem with getting angry at these people and short-tempered and not waiting. Next, the editors do something for us that has become a pattern in Exodus. 
was a pattern somewhat in Leviticus and is certainly a pattern in Numbers there's a narrative then there's some laws appended that relate to that narrative and the implication that you get is that the laws were given right then though you can tell by looking at the laws that they're from other contexts they take the law and they slap it into that context so that it illustrates the narrative that you've just been reading about that's how we get Numbers 15 where it is he always said to Moses say to the people of Israel when you come into the land you are to inhabit which I give you and you offer to Yahweh from the herd or from the flock what is this about? well it's laws about coming into the land just after the rejection of the land and they have to go back into the wilderness and you offer to Yahweh from the herd of the flock an offering by fire a whole burnt offering or sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering or at your appointed feasts to make a pleasing odor to Yahweh we've seen that phrase before then who, he who brings his offering shall offer to Yahweh a cereal offering, a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a fourth of a hint of oil. You know in Leviticus 2, 1 to 11, there's a long description of the cereal offerings as the second of the five kinds of offerings. Does anybody still remember those five kinds of offerings? The first was the whole burnt offering and the second was the cereal offering or grain offering. Then there was the sin offering and the the peace or peace offering or offering of uh, of uh, goodwill and lastly the guilt or reparation offering for committing a crime five kinds of offerings this is the second of those five divisions that you find in Leviticus uh, here interestingly it's tighter than in Leviticus Leviticus doesn't ever say exactly how much fine flour you should use here in verse 4 it's, it's singled out wine for a drink offering of course they wouldn't have a wine as a drink offering in the wilderness why? no grape juice yes all right, you're not going to have fine ground flour in the wilderness either. So these are uh, laws really that relate to the sacrifices in the temples when they were in the country. Prepare your burnt offering or sacrifice for each lamb. For a six or for a ram, you should prepare for a cereal offering two tenths of an ephah. Uh, it's twice as much for a ram. Now the ram was reserved for the guilt offering in Leviticus, but here it doesn't seem to be. It's a slightly different set of laws, either coming from a different time or a different place. A different place would be a different temple, or a different time would be an earlier century, say, than that in Leviticus. Leviticus is highly developed. You really have the final ritual that you come to in... Uh, the temple in Jerusalem represented in Leviticus but it's ironic then that even though Leviticus is so highly developed this is where you get the statement of exactly how much fine flour you should use verse 7 for the drink offering offer a third of a hint of wine pleasing odor to Yahweh when you prepare a bowl for a burnt offering sacrifice to fulfill a vow or for peace offerings to Yahweh and what shall offer with the bull of cereal offering of three tenths of an ephah one tenth, two tenths, three tenths half a hint of oil as opposed to a third of a hint see it's larger for each of the lamb, ram, bull verse 11 thus it shall be done for each bull or ram or for each of the male lambs or the kids according to the number that you prepare so you shall do with everyone according to their number now you remember Leviticus made it the bigger animal was for the whole congregation or for a high priest or a prince 
that right there tells you that you're, you're in a later period. There's no high priest or prince in this chapter. All right. Verse 13, all who are native shall do these things in, the, in this way, an offering, an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Yahweh. And if the stranger is sojourning with you, or if anyone is among you throughout your generations and he wishes to offer an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Yahweh, he shall do as you do. For the assembly there shall be one statute for you and the stranger who sojourns with you, a perpetual statute throughout your generations, as you are so shall the sojourner be before Yahweh. One law and one ordinance shall be for you and the stranger who sojourns with you. Okay, so here is the, uh, the free will offering, the appointed feast offering or vow offering together with explicit statements about oil, wine, and fine ground flour. Makes up a whole meal, you see. Right? That's the whole meal. As opposed to the fine ground flour we have, then there's the coarse meal next treated verses 17 to 21, this paragraph. He always said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, when you come into the land to which I bring you and when you eat the food of the land, we'll see this again in chapter 18, you should present an offering to Yahweh on the, of the first of your course meal, you should present a cake. It means a paste. It's a paste like, uh, oh, I don't know, a rough paste like pancake paste that's then fried on the griddle and becomes a cake. As an offering is an offering from the threshing floor, so you shall present it. Of the first of your course meal you shall give to Yahweh an offering throughout your generations. Okay. Verse 22, but if you err and do not observe all these commandments, now this is from another context, isn't it? It's been placed in here. All these commandments which Yahweh has spoken to you by Moses, this would naturally come at the end of a code. Right? Here we we have a couple of laws, but this phrase is referring to a whole Mosaic code that isn't here. This is something that probably came out of the Levitical code somewhere, originally. But if you err and do not observe all these commandments which Yahweh has spoken by Moses, all that Yahweh has commanded you by Moses from the day that Yahweh gave commandment and onward throughout your generations, then if it was done unwittingly without the knowledge of the congregation, all the congregation shall offer one young bull for a burnt offering, a pleasing odor to Yahweh with its cereal and drink offering according to the ordinance and one male goat for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the people of Israel. They shall be forgiven because it was an error. And they have brought their offering, an offering by fire to Yahweh and their sin offering before Yahweh for their error. And the congregation of the people of Israel shall be forgiven and the stranger who sojourns among them because the whole population was involved in the error. I know why the law is here. This business about the spies was what? This was an example of not a high-handed sin that had been planned down in advance, but what? That they fell into, if you had told them the day before, tomorrow the congregation as a whole is going to rebel against Yahweh, they would have said, no, that's, no, we're not going to do that. It wasn't their plan. They have, that's what it means. Bonnie, are you listening? This is what you said in Leviticus. Can you give us examples? I would, You said, I don't know about the rest of the class, but I would like to have some examples of what you mean by not high-handed sin as opposed to high-handed sin. And I said to you, it's all in the book of Numbers. Here we are. Okay. This is an example of not a high-handed sin. They, they, they got into mass hysteria. They sinned. Now a law is taken out of the holiness code and put here that relates to that sort of thing. Okay. I don't know. I guess it's a nice way that they put it together. I'd sort of like to have seen the law codes whole before they carved them up, and I'd like to have seen the whole running narrative all together. What do you think? It's too late to do anything now about it by about 35 centuries, but... But it probably developed over 
together That's true. We don't even know that the uh, that this dividing up this way was done all at once. We don't know that. Could have been little by little, as you say. If one person sins unwittingly, verse 27, the distinction here is between the individual and the group. Individual and group. Opposites that always have to be considered. Corporate sin, individual sin. I made a big deal about pointing out that there is such a thing as corporate sin and corporate personality in the Old Testament and that uh, it is correct to say that there can be such a thing as a corporate sin that requires the whole church to repent as a church. You can't say I didn't have any part in it. Just by belonging to the church there could be such a sin. Alright, now we're back to the individual because the law made this distinction. Again, what distinction was made in Leviticus? The individual, the whole congregation, the prince, and the high priest. So two of the four distinctions in Leviticus aren't here. This is probably from an earlier period. If one person sins unwittingly, he shall offer a female goat a year old for sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement before Yahweh for the person who commits an error. When he sins unwittingly, to make atonement for him, he shall be forgiven. And you shall have one law for him who does anything unwittingly, for him who is native among the people of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourns among them. But the person who does anything with a high hand, verse 30, same distinction that we saw in Leviticus, only it's much more developed in Leviticus. Whether he's native or sojourner, reviles Yahweh, and that person shall be annihilated from his people. Because he's despised the word of Yahweh and has broken his commandments, that person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. To wit, an example. Okay? We have just been given an example in the matter of the spies, of a non-high-handed sin, of falling into sin. Now, an example like that found in Leviticus 24, compare this to the guy who blasphemed the name in, Levitic in Leviticus 24. Same thing, there was a law, and then a story relating to the law. Same thing here. What's a high-handed sin, Bonnie asks? Glad you asked that, the editors say. We have an example for you. What does the fact that they have given us examples of unwitting sin and high-handed sin tell you? Was Bonnie the first person to ask that question? <laughs> when it stood out there as just a series of laws, somebody 30 centuries ago asked, could you give me an example? And so the editors obliged you by giving you an example of unwitting sin and high-handed sin. How is this a high-handed sin? Here's a poor man who was, you know, it gets cold at night in the desert. It gets very cold. It can be really hot in the day. It's amazing how in that country, uh, especially if you're up in the middle of the night, as you have to be doing archaeology, you can be absolutely freezing at 5 o'clock in the morning and by midday think you're going to die from the heat. Okay? Now this poor man was just gathering some sticks for a fire. What's wrong with that? What? Well, but it was unwitting sin, wasn't it? He fell into it, didn't he? He, he? he ran out of firewood and suddenly his family was cold. And No, that's the point. Yeah. How long had they been out there now? Fourteen months. And even before they got to Sinai, according to the Leviticus, there was a law about the Sabbath. Okay. Sabbath law has been stated over and over and over and over and over again. Gather sticks so you don't have to kindle a fire. You can keep a fire going, but you don't have to but don't kindle it. Why? Because kindling a fire when you don't have matches is what? It's a major deal. While there was no argument about throwing the stick on the fire and keeping it going, what was God saying? What's natural and not a big deal, fine, but what? Now this man isn't even starting from kindling the fire. What's he doing? <laughs> this is really... <laughs> he wasn't prepared. But it wasn't that he wasn't prepared. He, he's been living here for 14 months in, under these 
the guidelines have been stated and restated and restated ever more clearly and more explicitly as time has passed. That he's part of a whole society that lives its life this way. Everybody knows that it's a big deal what's going to happen on the Sabbath. Everybody knows to gather extra. Everybody knows about the man of the whole deal. What is his act of making a solitary journey out of the camp to gather sticks on the Sabbath tell you about how he felt about things? What? Yes, he was being defiant. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't high-handed sin. It was what? It was the result of thought. He thought about it. He thought about God's claims. He thought about what God wanted and he made a decision. And what decision did he make? He didn't want to have anything to do with it. And short of walking into the tabernacle and spitting on the priest, what's the sa sanctuary's holiness always linked to? The Sabbath. Keep my Sabbath and honor my sanctuary, right? I mean, that's the other way he could have done this. But instead, he waited for the Sabbath to come so that what? So that he could show everybody, everybody from the little children all the way to God, that what? He wasn't going to have any more part of this, that he had had it. That's the trouble mm -hmm. with knowing the truth. An Egyptian could go along in the middle way forever, just barely zinging along and maybe squeak into the kingdom. But when you know the truth exactly, you're in such a mess because you know exactly what it is. And this man knew exactly what it was. Did he know what he was doing? Did he know the result of what he was doing? Oh, yes. What did he think would happen? Did he think they would just say, oh, that's okay? <laughs> Look what happened to the blasphemer. Who also didn't do it by accident. What happened to him? He was stoned. What did this man think would happen? What he was really saying was, if I have to live this way, what? I'd rather die. I'd rather die. Yeah. And he just wanted to, instead of just killing himself, he wanted everybody to know how displeased he was with the whole system right up to God. Hmm. And uh, all the people, was, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. They weren't looking. The, in, the verb they found tells you what? means to stumble on. What does it mean? Nobody was even expecting that somebody would do such a thing. Right? They found him. Those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and, all, and to all the congregation. Now, Numbers is pretty gloomy because there's rebellion after rebellion after rebellion and you get the idea that things are sinking further and further but they weren't really. What was happening? Those who weren't making progress were what? They were being, they were dying off. And that was, it, and, and Israel was gradually being purified. Um, people didn't automatically join with everything that went wrong. These people found this man and what did they do? They brought him to Moses with some obvious surprise and concern that what? We found this man out there gathering sticks. Well, they set him aside in custody and Moses asked, what shall we do with him? Do you think the answer was a surprise to anybody? Was it a surprise when the blasphemer got the death penalty? I don't think this was a surprise. He always said to Moses, the man shall be put to death, all the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. We've talked about stoning as the fastest, easiest way in the ancient world to kill somebody. And the fact of the whole congregation doing this as a way of saying, we reject, not just that God rejects, but what? We reject what you've done. Mm -hmm. And they brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones as Yahweh commanded. That's what it means, whether native or sojourner, anybody who does anything with a high hand reviles Yahweh. That's what it means. 
Everybody else felt a positive clear conscience that they were doing kind of strong that they could. Yeah, the editors are saying the congregation, when they rejected going into the land then, made a terrible mistake that was a sin. But it was the kind of a sin that was a mistake. That after it happened, the people looked back and said what? The people didn't say we were right, they said what? That was a mistake. <laughs> And what, what they're telling us theologically, if you can look back at something that was wrong and say to yourself, when nobody else is looking, what? That was a mistake. I should not have done that. Then what? Then that has forgiveness in it. That when you look back on something that the Bible says is a sin and say what? No. I don't care what it says. I was right. That what? That's high-handed and that's where there's no possibility of atonement. The New Testament, that, what, what does Jesus call that? Jesus calls that obviously the what? The unpardonable sin. Same distinction. So as long as you don't get caught doing something. Oh, you see, this guy... Well, it's not a, a distinction isn't caught or uncaught. <laughs> this guy, these people found him by accident was to their surprise, but what? He certainly what? He certainly wanted them to find him. He was, wasn't out on the far side of the mountain secretly looking for sticks. He was near them so that they would see the point he was making. Now the tassels of remembrance. Where does this come from? Well, I only need read verse 40. Be holy to your God. In verse 41, I am your God, Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yahweh your God. That you recognize what? This is a piece of what? The holiness code. Yeah. What's it put here for? Oh, as a further addition to remember to keep the law. Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and bid them to make tassels on the corners of the garments throughout their generations. The early Canaanites wore tassels. But now all the Hebrews were going to have tassels of the same color, blue. The same as the blue in the sanctuary. Sky blue. Uh, to some extent this would make them look alike and give them more of a solid group solidarity and remember all the commandments of Yahweh to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes which you are inclined to go after wantonly this is a summary of the whole business of the the uh, rebellion of the the quail the spies the men with the sticks, the whole thing, right? Which you are inclined to go after wantonly. So you shall remember and do my commandments and be holy to your God. I am Yahweh your God who brought you off the land of Egypt. <laughs> All right, yes? There's one aspect of this uh, stone in those time of record that it's still um, makes me feel a little uncomfortable. And that's the fact that the congregation, I should have been saying, for everybody that's in front of the stone goes it's a wilder age. They had to shortly go in and kill Canaanites. Mass slaughter. And God told them to do it. Uh, we're not accustomed to that. Not at all. I was driving home this point uh, about what it meant to murder somebody in a uh, Hebrew prophets class and I said to one of my older more mature students that I could rely on to get a, a thoughtful discussion going how many people have you killed and he looked at me and without the slightest uh, blink of an eye and without joking said 14 and the way he said it everybody in the room knew he meant it <laughs> and after he said 14 a silence fell on the whole classroom. <laughs> the students looked at me and I looked at them and none, none of us knew what to say. <laughs> Did I know that he worked for the CIA as a professional assassin before he became an evidence? No. <laughs> what a bad choice. <laughs> All right, yes. 
So it's background, yeah. Most of us haven't ever done that. And something about the Indonesian government, I don't even want to... <laughs> yes, now, I understand that it, uh, it would make us uncomfortable because we're not accustomed to that. Yeah, it's certainly a while to rage. Now, you would think at this point that we are done with rebellion against God and Moses. Two more. Two more are now described, actually three more. Did you catch that there were two? Can anybody describe the two rebellions and what their basis or thrust was? Do you remember my pointing out that Deuteronomy remembers the rebellion of Dathan and Abiram against Moses as a separate issue once upon a time? Deuteronomy 11. Let's jump into the middle of the sentence at verse 4. Deuteronomy 11, 4. Deuteronomy 11, 4. What he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued after you, and how Yahweh has destroyed them to this day, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came down to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, sons of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up in their household and their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of, the, of Yahweh which he did. You shall therefore keep all the commandments which I command you this day, and so forth. See, Dathan and Abiram are treated as a rebellion against Moses uh, yes if you're used to Bible editing by now you can see the two stories fairly easily even though they've been placed together nicely as the two stories about the spies were placed together nicely all right Let's just read, which would you like to read first? The story about Korah or the story about Dathan and Abiram? Let's read Dathan and Abiram first since we're on them. So we have to take the and and translate the wow as a now, beginning the beginning of a story. Now Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, uh, yeah, that tells me uh, a lot about it right there. The uh, This Reubenite family, a rebellion arose in this Reubenite family against Moses' personal leadership, saying, you're making yourself a prince over us. What does that tell you? Yeah, that's right. They were the firstborn. And what did they want? They wanted the return of their royal prerogatives as the firstborn. And as far as they were concerned, Moses, who was a Levite, making himself the prince of Israel, was a usurper. And they said so. Now, what? why did they wait till then? Oh, I think because they thought that Moses' position had been weakened by the repeated rebellions against him. Possibly because they sensed in Moses himself some discouragement and wishing to give up that must have come through. I don't understand Moses really didn't want the job. Moses' leadership had even been embarrassed by the fact that what? Rebellions had come from this direction and that even from what? His own brother and sister had rejected him. And uh, I think as time went by, they saw an opportunity. 
the thing we have to remember is that if it had been up to Moses, what? She would have handed the rod over to them and said, fine, you do it. Let's see how you do. What? Their memory is extremely short. Do you think that they would have remembered what happened uh, in the previous rebellion, but they never seem to remember it? But even today, people don't. I mean, you find one little group after another trying to take power all the time. Once one starts and gets away with it, another one will. Yeah, they must have thought it was an unstable situation. Maybe they thought they had Yahweh's approval. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they thought as the firstborn they would have Yahweh's approval. They misunderstood how, how Moses got to stuff. Or maybe there was just something about Moses' attitude that made it clear that he really, really, really did not want this, and maybe they thought that just by insisting on having it, they would get it. Mm -hmm. In any case, it says that now Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, uh, and on the son of Peleth, all sons of Reuben, did what? Mm -hmm. Rose up before Moses, <coughs> together with a number of the people of Israel. This is not Korah who took men 250. They've, you've got two sets of verbs and two sets of actions here all run together. There's, Korah took men 250. But Dathan and Abiram rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel. Maybe you could underline that part of the sentence that relates to just Dathan and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel. This is an uprising, a rebellion. How do you separate these two? I've got two, I've got two verbs side by side, two direct objects side by side, and, and two groups side by side. They've been run together. All I need to do is separate them out. I, I, no, no, it wouldn't. And I know that the 250 relate to Korah, just by reading the rest of the story. I know the 250 men are Korah's story. And so I take everything that isn't Korah's story, and what do you know? I have a complete sentence. I have a question. So there were 250 Israelite men, comma, Roman, the uh, community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. Uh, yes, okay. The literal, I like the RSV's literalness in, in describing the ex exact syntax of the words. These people, Dathan and Abiram and Eliab and on the son of Pelas, sons of Reuben, uh, rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel. So what did Moses do when he heard about the uprising? What verse tells us what Moses' reaction was? What? Uh, verse 4. Verse 4. Let me see if I can find it. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face and said to Korah and all his company. No, that's not it. <laughs> what is it? Verse 12. Yes, indeed, it is verse 12. Moses sent, calling Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. They said, we will not come up. Now, they rose up against Moses, is what it says. They rose up against Moses. The other story says Moses and Aaron because it's about a whole different thing. This is against Moses and his leadership as political leader of Israel that they're against. Okay? They said, we will not come up. Verse 13, is it a small thing that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? A land flowing with milk and honey they have now defined as Egypt. <laughs> That's a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. That you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness. That you must also make yourself a prince over us. It's Moses' political power that they're against, these Reubenites, who think that as the leading family of the leading firstborn tribe, they should be running the show. All right. Moreover, you have, and it's, you made a, yourself a prince over us. 
Yeah, well, that was true. That was Moses' position. He did have total political power. What are they mad about? What has set them off? I think that it's the the unstable situation resulting from getting to the borders of Canaan, losing the land, and Moses announcing to them what? Okay. Go back into the wilderness. There's a general unstable situation throughout all the people. Was anybody happy with this? No. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come out. All right. And Moses was very angry. Now, we've said before about Moses that what? <laughs> yes, that temper is going to destroy him. And he said to Yahweh, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, and I have not harmed one of them. So then what did he do? They wouldn't come up, so what did he do? No. No, I'll explain verse 24 presently. You can't, it's, it's mucked up from the Hebrew. Verse 25. Since they wouldn't come to him, what? Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram and the elders of Israel followed him. This was all about political control over Israel. So he took the elders of Israel with him. They said to the congregation, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs lest you be swept away with all their sins. So they got away from the dwellings of, and the editor, in order to make a running story, has to insert what? Korah in here. Skip Korah here, because uh, he, the editors have put the two stories together to make a story out of it. They got away from the dwellings of Dathan and Abiram. The rest of the sentence makes it clear. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents. Now, the standing at the door of the tents business is one of the refrains that we see in these stories about rebellions against Moses, right? And they're all in the setting of Moses' tent of meeting outside the camp, right? And they're all in the setting of that special role of Moses. So they're standing at the door of their tent, right? Stood at the door of their tents together with their wives their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. Those words make it very clear. What were they saying? The yes, that he was taking the power. And Moses was saying what? This wasn't of my own accord, not one thing. What? Yahweh sent me to do it. That's my defense. Hereby you shall know. 29. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they are visited by the fate of all men, then Yahweh has not sent me. But if Yahweh creates something new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive to Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised Yahweh. Okay. They're rejecting him, they're rejecting God, he said. And as he finished speaking these words, the ground under them split asunder, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with all their household and all the men belonged to, that belonged to them and all their goods. The editor has mucked around here. So they and all that belonged to them, there's the words, went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly.
And all Israel that were round about them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow them up, swallow us up. Okay. And that's the story of the rebellion of Dathan and the Byron. So much for them. <laughs> right? That's a bad way to go. Like a small earthquake Yes. No, 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 no. Yeah, you, you, uh, you, uh, the editors gotcha. <laughs> these two, these three sons of Reuben rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel. Verse, what verse is it? Two with a number of the people of Israel, unstated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're going to go to the other one, and we'll get the 250, the stated number. All right? Mm -hmm. Are we ready for the other one? Now Korah, the son of Ishar, son of Koath, son of Levi, took men, comma, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. You got it? It makes a sentence. It's all very complete. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you notice the distinction? Look, as soon as you say it against Aaron, we're not talking about Moses' tent of meeting. What are we talking about? The tabernacle. Yes. We're talking about the sanctuary and the Aaronite priesthood. We've seen this before. Right? If this is puzzling you, ask now. All right well-known men, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far! <laughs> what did Moses and Aaron gone too far about? Mm -hmm. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and Yahweh is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yahweh? I've got it. Moses and Aaron were the priesthood. And these were 250 leaders of the congregation. Who would have been the priesthood if it wasn't Moses and Aaron's family? Who would have been the priesthood? Well, there were two ways. We saw the shift. Either the priesthood is a separate tribe or what? What was the other older way? The first, the first or the firstborn, the patriarchal system. Now, these are the patriarchs, right, who would have been... Now, this is not about Moses' political authority. Mm -hmm. This is about what? Mm -hmm. This is about the priesthood. Their gripe is the Mosaic and Aaronite priesthood. That's their gripe. They don't like it. They want the old patriarchal system of the leaders of the families mm -hmm. to be the priests of each respective family. The whole congregation is holy. Therefore, why have this inner band? Why have one group to be the priesthood? Let's go back to the patriarchal system. And of course, everybody who'd had his authority as a priest taken away in his house said that's not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Everybody who didn't like Moses, didn't like Aaron, this would be a good thing to join right in. Okay? Now we find out as we read on further that Korah had a hidden agenda. <laughs> You know what a hidden agenda is? It's where you say one thing, but you really mean another. Korah really wanted to use this argument about going back to the patriarchal system of firstborn priests to unseat Moses and Aaron so that what? So that he could have the priesthood. He was using these people. And here we have a miniature of the great controversy with the devil manipulating behind the scenes to be God. All right.
Mm -hmm. uh, so the first argument, these 250 leaders do not want a special priesthood, they want to go back to the patriarchal system. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yahweh? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face and said to Korah and all his company, In the morning Yahweh will show who is his and who is holy. And he will cause him to come near to him. Him whom he will choose, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, uh, Korah and all his company, put fire in them. Was all his company Levites? No. They were various patriarchal leaders. Uh, take censers, Korah and all his company, the people who would have been priests in their families, Okay, let's let you adopt the role of priest then. Get your censers. You want to be priest? Let's do it. Put fire in them. Put incense on them before Yahweh tomorrow. And the man whom Yahweh chooses shall be hol the Holy One. Of course, as soon as you say, get your censers, put incense on them, and come to the sanctuary, you have to think of whom? Who springs to mind right away? They never divide A wise man would have said what? If we go over there, we'll be burned to a crisp like Aaron's sons made of the Bayou, who offered unholy fire. I'm not going. But they didn't. They thought that they were going to get this. Now then, uh, do you remember what the words were uh, that they opened this challenge to Moses? What were the opening words in uh, the first thing they said in verse 3? You have gone too far. And how does Moses answer them? <laughs> you have gone too far. Strike out sons of Levi. Why? These people were not sons of Levi. Well, where did the words come from? By now we've gotten used to the, wor the word dittography. What does dittography mean? What is dittography? Ditto means repeat. Graphic means to write. Dittography is to write some words twice by mistake. Where did the word sons of Levi come from? Yes, from where? Not from earlier, where? In verse, uh, three or three. No, 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 it's not that far away. Where is it? It's verse 8. So it's the next line. He says, here now, what? You see the sons of Levi. Mm -hmm. And by dittography, it's gotten attached to you've gone too far. You understand? You've got to look physically at the page and you'll see. You see you, oh, I see. For those who have little translations, an RSV or new RSV or anything like that, you'll see you, uh, Sons of Levi close together. Mine happens to have a, the words right one above the other. It's very obvious how the photography came about. The opening challenge to Moses and Aaron was, you have gone too far. Moses finishes up by saying, you have gone too far. He's not talking to the Sons of Levi, he's talking to this masked 250 people who were leaders from the various tribes. Now, verse 8 begins a separate section. In verse 8, Moses stops addressing the 250 leaders of the congregation who all want to be, who want to have a patriarchal priesthood. And in verse 8, he addresses Korah because he says, beginning in verse 8, something different. He says that what Korah is after is not a patriarchal priesthood. What does it say? What is Korah after? This is the hidden agenda. Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of Yahweh, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he has brought you near him, and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? 
And would you seek the priesthood also? Moses is making an accusation here. What is he accusing Korah of? He's accusing Korah of being a liar. He's saying that Korah has instigated a rebellion saying that he wants to go back to the patriarchal priesthood system, but what he really wants is what? Yeah, he wants the priesthood. Therefore, it is against Yahweh that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you murmur against him? It's not Aaron that's the issue. It's what? It's what Yahweh set up. Okay. What happens next? Where do we go from here? Verse 16. Verse 16. Now these are not repetitions here. This is because he says two different things. And Mo Moses said to Korah, he's talking to Korah now. You catch that? First he talked to the 250 men. Then he talked to Korah. He said both Korah out. Moses said to Korah, be present, you and all your company before Yahweh, you and they and Aaron also tomorrow, and let every one of you take his censer and put incense on it, and every one of you bring before Yahweh his censer, 250 censers, you also and Aaron, each his censer. So every man took his censer and they put fire in them and laid incense on them and they stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And this is the sanctuary, of course. Okay, it's clear what's happening now. It's the next day. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the congregation. And Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Makes me think of the spies. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of all flesh, shall one man sin and wilt thou be angry with all the congregation? This is interesting. This is individual as opposed to corporate. Moses and Aaron argue this time that it's not the whole congregation's fault that this impasse has come about. It's what? Huh? Korah himself. Moses and Aaron put the blame, pin the blame directly on Korah for this rebellion, not the whole congregation. And Yahweh said to Moses, Say to the congregation, Get away from the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Dwelling, rather. Now, this is the only place where the word Mishkan is in a sentence that means somebody's individual dwelling. Because Shekan means to dwell in authority as a king dwells or is seated. It means to be seated as to say the king is seated on his throne, the court is sitting. It means that the king is in authority, sitting as king. And Mishkan was the place of his sitting. Okay? This is a word that is regularly, 100% of the time except for here, a word for the sanctuary. Okay? We translate it tabernacle, which means to dwell or to sit. What it actually says is get away from about the tabernacle. Why? Because God was about to burn him dead. The editor has added of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to make a story. Because he's run the two together. He has to make a story that makes sense, you see. What the original says simply is that at this point God said what? To the congregation. Look. Korah is there with the 250 people and he's brought the whole congregation to gather around him. Right? God has said his usual thing to Moses and Aaron. And what's that? Get away because I'm going to destroy the whole congregation. Moses and Aaron have said what? It's not the congregation's fault. It's this Korah's fault. And so then God says, then tell the congregation to get away from the sanctuary. Why? What's about to happen? 
Now look, if you were one of the 250 people and the order came, get away from the tabernacle, what would you do? A wise man would have thrown down his censer and walked, walked away with everybody else and said, okay. But what? They stayed. The congregation left. Right? So now, to read this properly in its original setting, it simply says, get away from the tabernacle. Then Moses, uh, oops, I just started reading the next verse. <laughs> verse 35. And fire came forth from Yahweh and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. Which is what we expected. Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Eliezer the son of Aaron the priest to take up the censers out of the blaze, then scatter the fire far and wide. For they are holy, the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives. So let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, for they uh, offered them before Yahweh. Therefore they are holy. Thus they shall be assigned to the people of Israel. So Eliezer the priest took the bronze censers which those who were burned had offered, and there were, they were hammered out as a covering for the altar, to be a reminder of the people of Israel, so that no one who is not a priest who is not of the descendants of Aaron, should draw near to burn incense before Yahweh, lest he become as Korah and as his company, as Yahweh said to Eliezer through Moses. Right, so here we have a complete story about the priesthood. What's the issue in the first case? Tell me about Dathan and Abiram. What was the issue? A Reubenite rebellion against what? Moses' political authority. What was the issue with Korah? Korah and leaders of the various tribes, patriarchal leaders, wanting the patriarchal priesthood again, though Moses claims that Korah is lying and the real issue is Korah is using these men to grab the priesthood for himself. All right? And two different dispositions of the story. Pretty clear? Because with the hereditary descendants of the in all the priesthood, there was no chance for anyone except for rebellion to grab it back home. That's right. There was no chance for anybody else to be a priest. And that's what they didn't like. Now we're going to see Levites trying to become priests in the book of Judges. And that's part of what this is about. Mm -hmm. That there was there were successive Levitical rebellions trying to regain the priesthood. And when during the period of the Judges, there was a lot of patriarchal priesthood going on again. And that's one reason this story was kept alive and pointed out and repeated. The timing of these two things, what happened was the same time? Uh, see, they don't tell us anything about the period of the wilderness. First, they were turned back from the borders of Canaan. Then the next thing, they're on the borders of Canaan again, and Miriam dies. Forty years have passed. Somewhere in these forty years were these two rebellions. Did they happen one week and the next week, like really close together? Or were they twenty years apart? Can't tell. Good question, though. I don't believe the editors knew if they were close together or not either. All right, now then. Continuing with the with the rebellion of Korah. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the people of Israel lately escaped from the fire, murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of Yahweh. This group had an Egyptian magician's attitude. That's what it is. They had an Egyptian magician's attitude. They thought that these things happened how? Moses was a magician who did these things by his magical powers. Okay? And they kept attributing Moses' actions to his own magical powers where he's manipulated to keep himself in power. They won't take Moses' word for it that he's there because God insists that he be there. Uh, you have killed the people of Yahweh. <laughs> well, Moses' temptation certainly was to let them be killed. When the congregation had assembled against Moses and against Aaron, 
They turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of Yahweh appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and Yahweh said to Moses, Get away from the midst of this congregation, that I may consume them in an instant. Well, that, that, and they fell on their faces. Now that tells me very clearly what Moses' intention had been. What had he been thinking? When they came and said to him, You've killed the people of Yahweh, what did he, what was in his mind? Yes. Yes, I think this was obviously his last straw. He was just uh, just beside himself here, and he was willing to do it. So what did God quickly say? <laughs> Whenever Moses fell into this trap, what did God say? Yeah. Step aside so that I can kill him. And then Moses, feeling his sense of duty, would quickly say, No, we can't have that happen. So he said <laughs> to Aaron, Take your censer and put fire thereon from off the altar and lay incense on it. Carry it quickly to the congregation to make atonement for them, for wrath has gone forth from Yahweh. The plague has begun. So Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran into the midst of the assembly, and behold, the plague had already begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. He stopped between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Now those who died by the plague were 14,700, beside those who died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the plague was stopped. That is the sanctuary here. The tent of meeting is clearly the sanctuary. Whenever we have the Aaronite priesthood as an issue. All right. Uh, Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and get from them rods, one for each father's house, from all the leaders, according to their father's house, twelve rods. This is still about the patriarchal system here. He wants a rod from each of the tribal leaders. Write each man's name on his rod and write Aaron's name on the rod for Levi. For there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. Then you shall deposit them in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. And the rod of the man whom I choose shall sprout. Thus I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the people of Israel which they murmur against you. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, all the leaders gave him rods, one for each leader, according to their father's house, twelve rods. The rod of Aaron was among their rods, and Moses deposited the rods before Yahweh in the Ten of Testimony. On the morrow, Moses went in the Ten of Testimony, behold, the rod of Aaron, for the house of Levi, had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and bore ripe almonds. Okay. Fertility symbols here. Just a blatant fertility symbol, a rod that sprouts almonds. But a, a great Canaanite fertility symbol. So, how is Israel going to get fertility in life? Through the priesthood of Aaron. Here's another one of those who will talk to the people in their own language. Okay. So if Canaanite fertility symbols is what will work, then what? Then we'll use Canaanite fertility symbols. All right, Moses brought out all the rods before Yahweh to all the people of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. Yahweh said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end of their murmurings against me, lest they die. Thus did Moses as Yahweh commanded him, so he did. The people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish. We are undone. We are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of Yahweh shall die. Are we all to perish? Well, yes, unless the Aaronite priesthood was accepted. Yes, so now, why do we have this long chapter 18 and 19 here? What are they here for? Duties of Levites, offerings for the priest, tithe for the Levites, the Levites tithe for the tithe, the red, the egg, of the red heifer ceremony, uh, producing the water of uncleanness with which they could be washed. These are the answers to the question at the end of the narrative. The laws here answer the question at the end of the narrative. The last verse of chapter 17 results in this next series of laws. Narrative, laws relating to the narrative. Narrative, laws relating to the narrative. So he's giving case, casual, 
case, cases, yes, cases, cases to illustrate laws. the laws. Yes. So, okay, this, this is now the end of the, of the uh, patriarchal uh, story. Yeah, this is the real end. And this but, is the answer to the last Yes, question. that's the answer to the question. There's not any chance of any patriarchal system anymore. It's got to be a Levitical priesthood, it's got to be the Aaronite priests among the Levites. Uh, yes. Um, now then, let us read. So he always said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity in connection with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity in connection with your priesthood. The Aaronite priesthood. This is very explicit here. And with you bring your brethren also the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join you and minister to you while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. A very unusual, a very unusual phrase. Late phrase, the tent of the testimony. They shall attend you and attend to all the duties of the tent, just the tent there, but they shall not come near to the vessels of the sanctuary, mikdash, kodesh, holy, mikdash, you see the kodesh in it, right? The holy place, sanctuary. That's what sanctuary means in Latin, isn't it, right? Sanctuary, holy, right? Sanctus is holy. And... Uh, you know that Kodesh is holy in, in Hebrew, right? That's a holy person. A priest is sometimes called a holy one. And Mikdash is the uh, phrase built on it. Okay. On the root Kodesh, holy. Sanctuary, right? We said that tabernacle to dwell was from Shechem, right? And we make Mishkan. to dwell, meaning in the, in the technical sense, to uh, sit in authority, a king, to sit in authority, as a king does. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. And uh, the sanctuary is the term in uh, Mikdash in verse 4. They shall join you and attend to the tent of meeting. We have the tent of the testimony. Oh, hell, they, they, they do. They're using every um, uh, let's see, what is it? I've lost it. Tent of meeting, for a This is very deliberate here. They've used any and every phrase for the sanctuary that you can think of. Where, where is the priesthood? The priesthood that is acceptable is the priesthood that ministers in the Mishkan, the Mikdash, the Ohel Edut, the Ohel Moed. Whatever name you give to a temple, a sanctuary, what? There's only one group that can minister there. It's pretty clear? Yeah, the phrasing is very deliberate here. 
That's because of this issue about the, the priesthood. What about the individual altar? After all, we have altars in places where there aren't temples. Verse 4, they shall join you and attend to the tent of meeting for all the service of the tent. And no one else shall come near you and you shall attend to the duties of the sanctuary and the duties of the altar. That there be wrath no more on the people of Israel. That there be wrath no more on the people of Israel. We are all to die. Are we all to perish? Is how it ended up above. So the law answers the question. The, when the laws get this way, where the laws become part of the narrative, they're almost a narrative form. Yeah. They're serving two purposes. They're serving a legal purpose as laws, and they're serving a purpose as part of the narrative. They're not so legal now that they've been torn from their legal context. And behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to Yahweh to do service of the tent of meeting. And you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and that is within the veil, and you, and you shall serve. We had some ordination of the Levites early in Numbers, didn't we? This probably came from that earlier section, but is now here deliberately. I give you a priesthood as a gift, and anyone else who comes near shall be put to death. Then Yahweh said to Aaron, And behold, I have given you whatever is kept of the offerings made to me. All I have consecrated things of the people of Israel, I have given them to you as a portion, and to your sons as a perpetual due. They shall be yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every whole burnt offering of theirs, every cereal offering of theirs, and every sin offering of theirs and every guilt offering of theirs, that's four kinds. One of them's missing. Which one is missing? Hmm? The peace offerings are missing, yes. Because they weren't for the priests. The communion offering or the offering of well-being mm -hmm. was shared with the family of the offerer, so it couldn't be in this list here, of course. It wasn't the priest's offering. Which they render to me shall be most holy to you and to your sons, and the most holy place you shall eat it. Every male may eat of it is holy to you. This also is yours, the, uh, the offering of their gift, all the wave offerings of the people of Israel. That's the first fruits, of course. I have given them to you and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it all the best of the oil, the best of the wine and the grain, all the fruits of what they give to Yahweh, I give to you. The first ripe fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring to Yahweh, shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Everything that opens the wound, womb of all flesh, whether man or beast, which they offer to Yahweh, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall redeem, rather than kill as a sacrifice. And the first thing of unclean beasts you shall redeem, because, of course, you wouldn't want to sacrifice a pig to Yahweh, or an eel, or whatever. And the redemption price, parentheses, at a month old you shall redeem them, you shall fix it five shekels in silver, further parentheses, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 giras. This was established later when they established the norm of the actual prices at the temple in Jerusalem. We see that a lot, where they add to it a specific weight for a shekel. But the first thing of a cow, or the first thing of a sheep, or the first thing of a goat, you shall not redeem, they are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar, and shall burn their fat as an offering by fire, pleasing unto Yahweh. But their flesh shall be yours, as the breast that is waved, and as the right thigh are yours. All the holy offerings which the people of Israel present to Yahweh, I give to you, and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt forever before Yahweh for you and for your offspring with you. And Yahweh said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. Further, this sounds very like the uh, opening passages in, in Leviticus. To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service which they serve, 
their service in the tent of meeting. That's interesting. The offerings were for the priests and the tithe was for the Levites. <laughs> yes. So could we pay the church janitor from the tithe? Yeah, you could. Yes, you could pay the preachers from the offerings too. Yeah. I I've heard a lot about what's biblical use of tithe and what isn't. Well, you got to gather all the biblical evidence before you say what the biblical use of a tithe is. What? Read the whole Bible, even Numbers. <laughs> Twenty-two, and henceforth the people of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. Again, an answer to the question at the end of the narrative in 17. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting and bear their iniquity. There shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and among the people of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as an offering to Yahweh, have given to the Levites for an inheritance. That's their inheritance. Therefore... I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. And Yahweh said to Moses, Moreover, you shall say to the Levites, When you take from the people of Israel the tithe, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to Yahweh, a tithe of the tithe. And your offering shall be reckoned as to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. So shall you present an offering to Yahweh from all your tithes, which you receive from the people of Israel, and from it you shall give Yahweh's offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all the gifts to you, you shall present every offering due to Yahweh from all the best of them, giving the hallowed part from them. Therefore you shall say to them, When you have offered from it the best of it, then the rest shall be reckoned to the Levites as produce of the threshing floor, as produce of the wine press, and you may eat it in any place, in any place, not a holy place, in any place, and as produce of the wine press, even though it's tithe, it has become your normal income. It's not, it's secularized, as it were. Right? It's an animal brought as a tithe. It's grain brought as a tithe. Pay your tithe out of it, okay? These people in your district brought you ten animals as their tithe. And a hundred quarts of oil. Do what? Choose the best animal. Give it as your tithe. Take ten quarts of oil. Then the rest of it has become secularized and is what? Is now your income and what? You can use it as for secular purposes as if it were just a normal, even though it was somebody's tithe, you can now eat it anywhere, do with it what you will, it's your income. All right. You may eat it in any place, you and your household, for it's your reward in return for your service in the tent of meeting. You shall bear no sin by reason of it when you have offered the best of it. And you shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel lest you die. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, isn't that what we do? If you... Uh, are paid a salary with tithe and then you go buy some teacups with it, what have you done? It has become secularized, of course. Now the red heifer sacrifice, the Egla sacrifice, is directly related to this whole narrative sequence here. Right? Of course, chapter 18, pinning down the special role of the Levites and adding to it things that may originally have been part of Leviticus but are now introduced only here, makes it appear that as a result of Korah's rebellion, a, a further clarification and specialization of the Levite role has been made, right? Now that chapter 19 is continuing the same vein, the Egla sacrifice, E-G-L-A-H. Uh, now, Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the law which Yahweh has commanded. Boy, is that an obtuse beginning. <laughs> Look, I can see the title that was once attached to this law there. 
there was once a title that said what? This is a statute of a law that Yahweh's commanded, it once said. And it must have stood at the head of this ritual. And, and then it's been put into this running narrative and the editors have added, now Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, producing a hopeless beginning that says this, now Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the law which Yahweh has commanded. <laughs> Sometimes these ladies and gentlemen over-edited <laughs> and needed an editor to edit what they did. Tell the people of Israel, maybe if they had just omitted 2A, this is the statute of the law which Yahweh commanded, it would have read better. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect in which there is no blemish and upon which a yoke has never come. The redness, obviously, is related to the idea of blood, making it a very special animal. And you shall give her to Eliezer the priest, and she shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take... Uh, yeah, you know, if we didn't have this editorial heading in 19.1, now Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, if we didn't have that sitting there, when would we assume this law came into existence? After Aaron, mm -hmm. After Aaron died. Why? Bec Eliezer. When you say Eliezer, the priest, the priest is a phrase that refers only to what? The high only the high priest is the priest. There's only one priest in Israel, and his sons were his assistants, but there was only one priest. The high priest was the priest. So, as the text stands, the body of it, this is after the death of Aaron. They've added it in here and added an editorial beginning in 19.1 that isn't correct as far as I'm concerned. Minor compared to the opening verse of the book. All right, now. Give her to Eliezer the priest, she shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered before him, and Eliezer shall, uh, the priest shall take some of her blood with his finger and sprinkle some of her blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. This is meaning the sanctuary. And the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Her skin, her flesh, her blood, and her dung shall be burned. We noticed that there were a number of sacrifices in Leviticus that had to be sacrificed in a clean place, right? Isn't that how the sin offering was done? Good. Yeah. This is a special kind of sin offering. The heifer shall be burned in her sight, her skin, her flesh, and her blood, with her dung shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet stuff. Again, what is all this related to in Leviticus? The use of cedar and hyssop and scarlet stuff. Remember that special ritual of the two birds? one of which is killed and the other that goes free when you have had an illness that they thought you were going to die and you were on the edge of death and then you recover and you go through that special ceremony that indicates that you've been healed and the cedar and the hyssop represents the medicine by which you were healed. Remember that? Yeah. Well, this is, hmm? yeah, they also have a, a nice odor in the burning too. That's right. A nice, cedar. yes, a nice uh, incense yes. I indicating atonement. All right, and the scarlet stuff representing any red cloth representing blood. A red cloth, see, a red cloth right away, red cloth makes you think of what? A cloth that has been dipped in blood, and therefore, uh, I said this often, similarity of appearance equals similarity of essence. Similarity of appearance equals similarity of essence. In fact, grape juice is not blood. If you injected it in somebody's veins, what? <laughs> yeah, you would have a dead person. But yet, all the way through, we have noticed that grape juice is treated as what? It is blood, because similarity of appearance equals similarity of essence. Red stuff. Red stuff in the sanctuary. Red stuff in these offerings. Red cloth. What is that? Maybe the red was from tamarisk rind or something. Maybe that's how they got it red. But once it's red, it's blood. A bloody cloth. 
civilizing life. All right. So the hyssop, the uh, red, scarlet, the cedar wood, all relating to an, what we've already seen, cleansing, relating to the medicinal sacrifices we saw earlier, the idea of healing, the idea of washing as one concept of atonement from sin. Cast them in the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. And afterward come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening. He who burns the heifer shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his body in water and be unclean until evening. And a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. They shall be kept for the congregation of the people of Israel for the water of impurity for the removal of sin. He who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And this shall be to the people of Israel, to the stranger who sojourns among them, a perpetual statute. What this is all about is transferring the, 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 the life-giving property of the red heifer and the cedar and the hyssop and the scarlet stuff, all life-giving property, all healing property to the water, making a kind of water that is what? Making a kind of water that is life-giving. Yeah. A special kind of water. We might even call it holy water. Now, verse 11. He who touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh, so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third and the seventh day, he will not become clean. Whoever touches a dead person, the body of any man who has died, and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of Yahweh, and that person shall be cut off from Israel, because the water for impurity was not thrown on him, he should be unclean, his uncleanness is still on him. This is the law when a man dies in a tent. Everyone who comes into the tent, everyone who is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which has no cover fastened on it is unclean. Whoever in the open field touches one who is slain with a sword or a dead body or the bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Uh, for the unclean they shall take some ashes of the burnt offering and running water, burnt and offering and running water shall be added to the vessel. Then a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it on the tent and on all the furnishings and on the persons who were there and on him who touched the bone or the slain or the dead or the grave and the clean person shall sprinkle on the unclean on the third day and the seventh. Thus on the seventh day he shall cleanse him, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and, be at, and at evening he shall be clean. But the man who is unclean and does not cleanse himself, that person shall be cut off from the midst of the assembly, since he defiled the sanctuary of Yahweh, because the water for impurity has not been thrown upon him, he is unclean. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them. He who sprinkles the water from purity shall wash his clothes, and who touches the water from purity shall be unclean until evening. Whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean. Anyone who touches it shall be unclean until evening. I think there are two ways here to make uh, water of uncleanness. It, the second one is probably reference to the first, the ashes of the whole burnt offering, meaning the... Could it be like lime water? Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's lime water. And what's the purpose of that? It's a, it's a disinfectant, that's all it is. That's right, all of this ritual by which they believe that the life of the animal is transmitted to them by touching, we would say, in it, we would explain it in an utterly different way. What would we say? We'd just say they made a, an alkaline solution that was a disinfectant. We'd say, wash your hands with some boric acid or Right? Mm -hmm. Or some 40% alcohol or something like that. So, yes? Uh, no. It surely was. The, the Egla, the, the unclean after the, yeah. the Egla sacrifice, yes. yes. What did you call that sacrifice again? E G L A H, Egla. Because that's the name of the red heifer. It's just called the Egla ceremony wherever you read about it. Yeah. And not being very original, I just nothing. Okay. That's not the Hebrew for the red. 
Yeah, it's the name given to the ritual, the whole ritual of uh, this cleansing from the holy water. Uh, no. What did it mean that they were unclean that they couldn't do certain things? They couldn't go into the camp. Into the... Yeah, they had to stay outside the camp. What? No. No, it was uh, whoever was nearby. Members of the family, whoever was around the person. If the person died of a heart attack and died there, you weren't clean. Carried the body out. Yeah. There was a place, we talked about this before, where you would have remained unclean. There were things to do outside the camp. Why? They had some things outside the camp. What did they have outside the camp? Huh? The dump was one thing. What else? Hmm? Huh? Didn't they have fields? Fields the well, maybe in some places in the wilderness, because it does mention fields, but probably their flocks were outside the camp. But wouldn't it also be a, um, a precaution to, to spreading any disease germs they might have caught from? <clears throat> they had perfectly good precautions. This is a psychological additional precaution. Mm -hmm. This is a further ritual. Why? How are they feeling right now in this period after they were sent back into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. How were they feeling? Mm -hmm. Rejected. Mm -hmm. Rejected, yes. What's the word? What were they feeling? Hopeless. Hopelessness sprang from this feeling they had. What was guilty. the... Guilty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were feeling guilty. They were feeling guilt. So the anger is the guilt of... Yeah, it's a way of dealing with guilt just a further way of saying that God can forgive you and atone you and clean you, make you clean. They were feeling, they were feeling unclean. They were feeling that they had messed something up. Uh, what would you say about that? Is that a bad sign or a good sign? Oh, that's a very good sign. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Why would I say that's a good sign? How is that an improvement? They weren't working on that. Uh, they don't yeah. Without a sense of sin, there can't be any repentance, right? Uh, yeah, there's no... I'm not sure that the first ceremonies they went through was anything more than a learning experience to get them used to the idea. It's the life situation of screwing up repeatedly that got them to the place where they had some sense of needing atonement. Yeah. Uh, yes. There's no there's absolutely no chance of salvation if there's no sense of sin. There's gotta be guilt before there can be forgiveness. Uh, yeah. Something in the wilderness during the in the wilderness. Um, now, chapter 20, verse 1, something odd happens here. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed at Kadesh. Uh, and Miriam died there and was buried. What's the problem with that verse? Kadesh is on the southern border of Judah. They were already there when they almost entered the land and went back. It's on the northern border of the wilderness of Paran, which is north of the wilderness of Zin, which is southern Sinai. Right? They couldn't have been in the wilderness of Zin and, and uh, Kadesh. It's absolutely impossible. Um, plus, Let's suppose that they did come into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. What would I like to know? First month of which year? Yeah, what year? Yeah. We have accounted for only two years. We have 38 other years that we don't know which one we're talking about. It's a notice that must have 
It's an itinerary notice that must have once been complete. And it's been attached here to a different statement. The people of Israel stayed at Kadesh and Miriam died there. Okay. It's exasperating because we don't know anything about those 38 years. This is the only thing that could have told us something and it's screwed up. Now there was no water for the congregation and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our brethren died before Yahweh. Now we have to compare this to the story in Exodus 17, which happened before Sinai, when they first had no water. Now that was in the wilderness of Zin, all right. It's, I guess it's the notice of Miriam's death that's out of place. Would that we had died when our brother died before Yahweh. Who's the brother that died before Yahweh? Korah, yes. Why have you brought the assembly of Yahweh into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? Then why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates and there's no water to drink. Real problem. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to them, and Yahweh said to Moses, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them, so you shall give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the rod from Yahweh as he commanded him. Most liberal scholars say this is simply a doublet of uh, Exodus 17. It's the same story. It's almost the same words, word for word. Just the same story. It's a doublet got placed here by accident. But no, I would say that's not really it. It's a deliberate repetition of the story in Exodus 17, all right. This is what happened before they ever got to Sinai, all right. This is what happened the first time they came into the wilderness of Zin, all right. But it's not a doublet. Because there's one little difference. And what is it? <laughs> yes. Well, why take the rod then? Why take the rod then? It says, take the rod. Your saint says, take the rod. Well, the staff represented what? It represented the power by which they had been delivered from Egypt and which all these things had happened ever since. Mm. You said this time you would tell the rock. Yeah, that's the little difference. Instead of strike the rock, you just tell the rock. Tell the rock. Now, what's the distinction for a people for whom uh, ritual and actions and body motions are everything? This distinction is not a minor one, but an important one. Okay, there's no water to drink. So, mm -hmm. now Moses goes and they find out he doesn't need the rod. Because he doesn't use the rod. Right? He tells them, and they would have caught the point. He gets there, and they're surrounding the rock, and they're not, they're back. The implication of the story is at the same place. See, they're back at the same place. They're reprising the prior story. Only what? This time, what should Moses have done and how, how, what would it have said to them? We don't need the rod. All you have to do is what? Ask. You see, there's no reason to panic because here we are back here. But it's not the rod that is powerful and it's not the magic of the rod and it's not magicianship or anything. Uh, Yahweh yeah, knows that you have needs so all we need to do is go there to this rock where we got water before and we'll just tell the rock we're out of water. <laughs> Give us some water. God wants water out of you. And what? <laughs> so what's the need for panic? What's the answer? There wasn't any need for panic, and the story would have been that, yes, you're out of water, all right, and, we're, and, and as soon as we're out of water, we and our cattle are going to start dying, and it's going to be a real desperate situation, except that there's no need for alarm, no need to be frightened. What? Out of water? 
All you need to do is ask. Oh, you're out of water, just say so. Water will come out of the rocks for you. See, they're not out of noises. No need to panic. And had things gone well, would the people have got the point? Would the congregation, which is going through time and going through a sequence here, would they have gotten the point that we're back to the same place, only we've made some advance? Mm -hmm. Yes. It was to calm them down to the point where they come to the place where there's no water and what? Mm -hmm. Instead of hearing about onions <laughs> and cucumbers, people say what? We're out of water. Let's ask the Lord for some water. So However, is this is this then saying how it should have been? Yeah, that's what um, should have happened. Yeah, but because the next point, next verse down there is where this is. was where this was where it was just too much, mm -hmm. and because the people were panicking only by habit, it wasn't a serious rebellion. God didn't treat it as very mm -hmm. serious, right? And he doesn't say to Moses and Aaron, let me alone that I can destroy them because it's not very serious. They're making progress. Mm -hmm. and, and the way God responded was that it's not, this isn't a big price. Just take the rod and go out, but speak to the rock this time so that they, they see it's not a big crisis. And the people were coming along. Unfortunately, Moses made it a big crisis yeah. and spoiled the symmetry of the story. And and uh, uh, ruined his own. Uh, let's see. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, "Here now, you rebels." Well, but God didn't treat it like that kind of a rebellion. If God didn't take it very seriously, what was the point? If God didn't think it was very serious, then what? It wasn't very serious. And in uh, two minutes, it all would have been over. But Moses screaming at them had what effect? Yeah. Shall we bring forth water from you from this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his rod twice. It would have served him right if what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all had happened. <laughs> the fact that water came forth abundantly was that God was being gracious to the people. But Moses, mm -hmm. Moses unconsciously made a, a serious blunder that showed where his mind had been going. What's the blunder in? Most commentators say this, part of the story's got to be missing. There's no explanation for how Moses got excluded. I've seen that in commentary after commentary. Well, what, yeah, well, yeah what, what happened there? What did he say? Sure, yeah, he, the people had equated him with the source of all this doings for so long that what? Just about the time that they were willing not to do that and to make the distinction between Moses and God, just when they were getting somewhere, this is the tragic part of it, just when they had gotten to the point where they could make that distinction, Moses said, mm -hmm. shall we, as if he was doing it, as if he and Aaron were doing it. So the rebellion against him, the people were saying, you make yourself prince of us, now you're making yourself Lord and God over us. Well, yeah, the people, yeah. The people, were. the people had gotten used to complaining in the same old language. Only it was more pro forma now and less serious as far as God was concerned. Same stuff over again, but not very serious. We can get them beyond this. They're there, finally. But Moses didn't. Uh, made it look like the rod was the source of the power. Like beating the rock is what, what it took to do it. Like he was the one doing it after all, he and Aaron. He always said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me or sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, contention, is what it says in Exodus 17, where the people of Israel contended with Yahweh and he showed himself holy among them. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it's uh, how did, how did Aaron get excluded from Canaan? <laughs> right to the end, he got himself excluded from Canaan by going along with Moses. <laughs> Moses blew it in what? Who was good. nothing if he wasn't consistent? <laughs> Where? When Moses went the wrong direction, Aaron what? It's the only time it happened. Aaron went with him. Aaron was a faithful follower. <laughs> we can say that good about him. He was a faithful follower. There's no response at all on the part of either Moses or Aaron. What does that tell you? Hmm? Yeah. Well, I guess by now both of them were pretty tired because in the beginning Aaron didn't want to have anything to do with it even coming out of Egypt. That's I true. Talk, I That's true. To talk. I don't want to be That's true. I, I, yeah. It makes you wonder if not only did they accept that God was perfectly right, but whether they had grown so tired that it was almost okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, if, if this story is, if the traditional timing of the story is <coughs> at the end of the 40 years, then there were only four adults alive who had left Egypt. Uh, <coughs> the, can you imagine the death watch? I was yeah. alive. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, we're going, and, and we're going in soon. Now, <laughs> yes. These old men dealing with all these young people. Yes. That, was, that must have been terrible. Yes, true. That must have been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds like someone who, a uh, grandmother who has to deal with uh, teenagers, doesn't she? college <laughs> students. <laughs> Yes, and as you say, if there was a death watch, then these, this younger generation would be increasingly um, anxious to do what? Go to, to, to go to get, to get on with it, yes. Uh, to do what they've been waiting to do all their lives, what they've been told from childhood up they were going to do. Yeah. And what happens next is they start the journey to the east so that they can enter from the east instead of the south. What the very next thing is beginning the the move toward the conquest. All right, and there we'll stop. <laughs>